All right, everybody. Glad to see you here. Uh, it's the last hour of the day. I'm excited to see so many people for the last hour of the day. My goodness, you guys are troopers. So one more hour, and then we get to go party, right? Day to night out tonight? All right. So we'll have a little fun before we do that, though. So my name is Michael Holcomb. I'm a senior customer success manager here at Tableau. <clears throat> I've thought a lot about enabling people. I talk to a lot of customers about education, measurement, best practices. I focus on financial services, so I've got a lot of customers. I have over 200,000 customers, users within my spot of accounts. And so what I want to do today is I want to empower everyone here to think differently about how you could go back and make change within your organization. So I'm hoping that at least one, two, three, maybe 10, uh, it might be aggressive, things stick, and you can go back and you can do something with this. So that's, that's my goal today, to empower everyone here. So we're going to go through an introduction. We're going to play a, a little bit of a game in the beginning. I'm going to talk about Tableau Blueprint, because not everybody perhaps is not familiar with it, although it's been everywhere through this conference. And then we'll just go through the analytics tracks, which are education, measurement, and then analytics best practices. So a little bit about me. That's my daughter, Mika. She just turned four recently. That was when we were in Poland. She was uh, having an ice cream cone. She speaks better Polish than I do her mother's Polish. She's fluent. And I just have, like, I can do colors and, you know, basic sayings and stuff. So it's, it's really kind of fun. It's amazing to watch. This is where we live in the East Village, New York. That's our brownstone. We love it. And then right down the street is Tompkins Square Park. If you don't know it, that's a very famous park in New York City. It's about 10 and a half acres. It has three playgrounds, lots of space. A lot of protesting happened back there in the day. A lot of crime. I see you nodding your head. Do you know, you know it? All right, a lot of crime happened there for a long time. A lot of music concerts came there. Um, it also happens to be the place where the uh, first Hare Krishna tr uh, prayer session happened outside of India, and so that is the birth of the Hare Krishnas in the United States, and you can go see the tree. You have to look up. The plaque is about 40 feet up now because the tree has grown, but that kind of adds a legitimacy to the whole thing. I've worked at a lot of different logos. The past 10 years, 11 years, before joining Tableau, I've been at Tableau about two years now. I worked at Bloomberg, spent 11 years there. I was a division CFO and a strategic financial advisor. I had a business in D DC called BGov. I also covered president's office and chairman's office. I've rolled out Tableau internally and externally to clients. I've been using it about, what I said, 12 years now. Um, so I have quite a bit of experience. I probably have more use cases in FinServe than many people see their entire career, which is why I cover banks, right? And so let's play a little bit of game here. So I'm going to, this is fill in the blank. So if you're not listening to a certain style of music by age 28, there's a blank percent chance that you ever will. Anybody want to give me a guess? Five? Way off. 90, that's pretty close. 85, close. 95%. That's right, 95%. Oh, that's what you meant. You said, but yes. There's also, if you haven't eaten sushi by age 35, there's a 95% chance you never will. Who cares? Why does this matter, right? Well, think about it. There's a lot of people over 28 and 35 that have never used visual analytics products. They've been using Excel and PowerPoint for a long time. And it doesn't matter why, whether their brains are less plastic or they're vested or whatever the reason is. It just matters that there's a bias for them to not want to engage in something new. So let's do another one here. Dr. Julia Schvetz did a study in the UK polling 200 restaurant managers. Their compensation is tied to their performance. These people actually have data. That's an important thing to know. What quintile performance do you think they were able to rank themselves in? Anybody want to give me a guess? Come on, it's not a trick question. Five? Five? <laughs> 35%. Oh my God, these people have data. 
They should be able to do something with it. She also found out that they were 47% of them were overconfident. So now we have two problems. We've got some people that just don't want to listen to country music. And we've got some people that have data and they're not making good decisions. So let's go a little more. So I don't like to think about community. I like to think of community as a mind, not our individual minds that make up a community. Because if you think about 100,000 years ago, your community said, don't eat that mushroom, right? Because somebody died from it. And so we just evolved as a community species. That's why we're here today. So if you think about all of us together as a community mind, what to change what we're doing is very hard, right? You have to either change, you have to dissociate yourself from the community, or you have to change the mind of the entire community. That's what we're doing. We're doing transformational change. We're saying, no, you can eat that mushroom. Perhaps they had an allergy, right? And what we're going to do is by changing everybody, we're going to pull along the people that just don't like country music, and we're going to empower the people that are looking at their data wrong by getting a whole bunch of people in the room and prioritizing our conversations not based on intuition but based on facts. This might be one you've already seen. Some percent of companies are failing to do analytics. This was a McKinsey study. 1,000 companies, 13 sectors, 12 geographies, over a billion in revenue. This is a pretty wide sampling. 92% are failing to do analytics at scale. Wow. Just let that sink in for a minute. Now, a lot of companies are doing a lot of good things, but very few people are getting it all right. So what is it that the 8% are actually doing? Well, the 8% believe in democratization of data. They believe in making data a heart of every conversation. They believe in empowering people and giving them the tools, but also the support, the education, and the structures to make them successful, and freeing them to do silly things like ask questions. Why is that number wrong? What's behind this trend. And I know it sounds silly, but when you free yourself from your role, I've been in finance for a long time, right? Finance people and accountants aren't used to being free necessarily. We do a lot of reporting. But when you free yourself, it's a change of a mindset. So what we did is we created the blueprint here at Tableau. We have a capability on agility. This is just rolling out the software, hardware, getting it set up, coming back to it. You have a capability around proficiency, which is what we're going to focus on today. And that literally is being proficient with the product. And then we have a capability around community, which is often the piece that most companies leave out. You have to remember, this is a self-service tool that we're rolling out. And if you're going to do it at scale, you need to provide a community, like we have here at Tableau Conference, of people that are excited about it. They're going to support each other. Cargill, we all know Cargill, right? Largest by revenue US com private US company. They have zero support tickets on Tableau. Zero. They handle it all internally. Wouldn't you love to be the rep on that account, right? <clears throat> That's because they have a tremendous focus on support and community. I think their first Iron Viz, they had 750 participants. Oh my goodness, right? So this is the blueprint itself. You start off, I'm not going to go through this whole thing. I'll just give you a highlight. You start off with the strategy and the executive advocacy. I can never get that right, no matter how many times I try. And the project teams, that's really your discovery. And then you go into your deployment, which is rolling out the software, setting up the education system that fits with where your organization's mindset is. And we'll talk more about that and then rolling out some communication strategy. Even if it's the most basic internet, that is better than nothing. You need a little bit of an onboarding program, tell people where to go, get some resources, set up a Slack channel, Symphony, I don't care what it is, right? You can build on it later, but let's get the basics. And then what you do is you evolve it. So you have your monitoring and your measurement and your engagement, right? Measurement is user behavior. What are people doing? How do we impact them? The engagement is uh, activities community activities. And the monitoring at the top, well, that's really understanding how your server's performing, 
a lot more technical things going on there, but it also ties into measurement. If you're doing good measurement, then you can use that to then project and feed into your monitoring. And ultimately, that's going to help you with your sizing, right, which is your maintenance down there, and your upgrades, so forth and so on. And then you have your best practices, and then at the end, support, which is, again, just curating that community, evolving it and advancing it. Right, that's all well and good, but we're here to talk today about analytics proficiency. So it's essentially an education program, user engagement, and then best practices. Everybody up with this? All right. So let's go into education. Tableau has a ton of educational resources out there. It's mostly free. We have games, we have role-based learning, we have license-based learning, we have events, we have user groups. It goes on and on and on and on. Well, that's to assist you with the programs that you're rolling out and to give you a lot of flexibility and choices about what works for your organization. I see so many companies that don't take advantage of this. There's so many different ways you can build on this. So let's talk about it. We've got formal training, right? We've got paid in class training that can be customized. We've got paid virtual training classes. I've done both of them because when I was managing people, I wanted to see what it was like. What's the difference between their, the two? They're both very good. You just as a manager, you have to give the people time to actually go through the classes. We've got online learning, which is incredibly cheap. It was $10 a month unless they've said it's something different at this conference. I haven't been paying attention. For four different modules, oh my goodness, learn at your own pace. The in-classroom training and the virtual training can be really good if you have a whole bunch of people and you're trying to jumpstart your program and build some capabilities very quickly. That's how that's useful. We've got role-based learning that came out this year. Woohoo! I'm so excited about this. This is amazing. This came out of a lot of the skill belt work that we did last year with our skill belt kit which many of you may have rolled out, quite a few large customers did. And that gave us a tremendous amount of knowledge about how people are using it and how successful this was going to be. So that's been rolled out this year. Now we have, what, 13, something like that, different roles targeted to people, server admin, designer, community leader. This is good stuff. But maybe you're not ready for that. Maybe you're just like, look, I'm not that advanced at my company yet. Let's just do some license learning right now. Then we'll come back after we understand what the roles are that we want to educate people on. And that's OK, too. We're just evolving a process here. We have continuing education, so we have live training. Oh, and we have Tableau Public, right? I don't know how many of you don't use Tableau Public, but if you're not, you should. I rip stuff from there all the time. It's free. Steal like an artist. It's OK. That's what it's there for. Especially when I have like creator's block. I'm like, I just don't know what to do with this data. I'll go out there and I'll get inspired by something. I'll just look. And undoubtedly, something eventually resonates. And I'm like, cool. And then we have events. We have Tableau Conference, Data -day Days Out. We have user groups all over the world. Many companies have their own user groups within their, uh, within their organizations. We have analytics, special things for data scientists. Like, it goes on and on and on. I recommend that you try to get your employees and your colleagues and your friends involved in some sort of community aspect. Maybe it's just Makeover Monday. Maybe it's going to a user group. Because it helps to understand who's out in the community, make some connections. Maybe they can help you out with a problem one day. And then lastly, we have the skill belt kit that we created last year. It's still out there. I'm not going to go into it too much because you can go watch the YouTube video from last year. And if you want it, I'm happy to add you to my Tableau Online account. And you can have the skill belt program, and you can enroll it out at your own company. The nice thing about that is you can customize it. And you can plug and play. You can do the role-based learning, but have your own things here as well. I don't care if you do an Alteryx track. That's OK or your own data track. It gives you all the tools to create it. And it comes filled with content already. I went through all the thousands of documents out there that we have and thousands of videos and curated it based on my experience as a leader. These are the skills that I want to see people have. And I did things like put proctoring in there because I want people to practice. That's the skill that I see most people really 
fall short of is iterating and storytelling real time in front of other people. You have to practice that stuff. It just doesn't come easily. We're all used to living in an Excel world where you create your presentation and you pitch it to the senior manager and they ask you a bunch of questions. You go, okay, that's great. Hopefully you got some of them. And then you come back later, can't get on their calendar. It's usually about three weeks. Anybody ever have that happen to them? And then when you do get with them, they're like, what was it we were talking about? Or priorities have changed. And you're like, yeah, we don't care about that anymore. We've moved on. And you're like, man. Um, so yeah, that's why I talk about that. So let's talk about measurement. So I've been talking a lot. Now I want you to talk to each other here for a minute. So I'm going to ask you some questions, because undoubtedly, I understand the processes that go behind this and why we're doing this. Measurement is really about data sources, how people are using data sources, where those data sources are coming from, where those data sources feed into dashboards, who's using those dashboards, how often they're using their dashboards, so forth and so on. You can glean a lot of information around your users and their behaviors, and then you can take action based on that information. So let's just talk about what some of that could be. So what's the first one on the right there? Let me see, I can't, my eyes are going, I can't read anymore, I'm going deaf, I can't hear anymore. Views traffic by project, okay. Someone tell me why that's important to measure. Come on guys, wake up. Great, so you're identifying, for those of you who didn't hear, people they had forgotten about, because she could tell there wasn't a lot of activity within that area. Oh my goodness, we need to go out and train them. She could also identify the critical content, the content that was most being used. That then helps them with their data strategy. If you think about it, oh, this is really important content. Now, maybe we should make this available to more people. Anybody else want to give me an idea on why this is important? Exactly. So pull it off. Get rid of it. Exactly. What about the next one? Views accessed 180 versus 30. Anybody? Days. Yep. Yeah, that's right. What's current versus stale? And then you can reach out to those people and say, what's going on with this? Is this no longer good data? Is this bad data? Is it just not relevant anymore? Should we pull this extract down? Or have we evolved it to something else? Content ownership, right? Who's creating the content? Who owns that content? What organization is being successful? So you can start to see where we can go with this. Once you open up the, peel back the layers of that Postgres database, oh my God, there's so much stuff in there. It's amazing. What about this? Login frequency. You want to tell me what you can do with login frequency? That's right. Give me your license. You haven't logged in in 90 days. Forget about it. No, 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 I looked. No, I can tell you didn't. We know this stuff. Users do that. They'll try to, they'll lie to you. Let's just call it what it is. What about days since last login? Same thing, right? It's giving you ideas of what users are doing and their behavior. This is really useful stuff. Subscriptions and alerts. Oh, this is a good one. Why would you want to know about this? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Think about those executives, right? You want to use subscription and alerts for those people so you can tell which ones are actually using it. And then you can determine whether your project's being successful or not. 
Those people don't want to have to go to Tableau after watching them going to fall off. They don't want to have to go to Tableau. They want it to come to them. They want to wake up and see that dashboard in the morning and be like, oh, I need to go check on this. Bob, you know what I mean? If they're using subscription and alerts, your projects are being successful. This helps you identify what's working and what's not working. Here's a whole bunch. What about distribution, load times, extract performance, subscriptions delivered? I know it's the end of the day. It's tough, huh? Infrastructure. That's exactly right. Infrastructure. Now you're starting to understand how your content's performing, how your extracts are performing. Are they really slow? Why are they slow? Are we all stacked up against each other? Do we need to spread this out? Do we need to schedule it? Why do we have so many extracts? Are these extracts just a whole bunch of Excel workbooks that somebody's loaded up from their desktop? Bad, naughty, naughty, naughty. Let's fix that. Right? So you can see where we can start going with this stuff, particularly the load times. And we'll talk about this a little later, but if you've got a workbook that's taking 10 seconds to load, you might want to have a conversation. If it's 25 seconds, then you need to go tell them you're going to take it down if they don't fix it particularly if it's going to senior people, for a couple different reasons. One, people aren't going to use it. They're going to get frustrated with it, right? If you guys have worked with traders, three seconds is all they're going to give you, all right? And if it's executive, you got three, five seconds. That's about it. But it also bogs down your server. You get a whole bunch of people, and their workbooks aren't performing. It's going to slow down your server. I was talking to TD Bank earlier this week at the Data Leaders Summit. And they were telling me that they have a workflow for publication of content. And they go through it, and they look at it, and they assess its performance, and then they give feedback. Their average concurrency should be around 500 users based on the size of their um, cores, how many cores they've rolled out. But they've squeezed out 750 concurrent users because they have a process in place to publish content that includes performance recordings includes looking at this and assessing it how it's doing on the server. Performance optimization. We're going to get to this in a little bit. But a lot of people don't know, if you're going to run it on your server, you need to turn it on for your server. And this is how you do it. It's pretty easy. I'm not going to do this part because it's so simple. But you should go back to your site admins, ad admins and say, can you do performance recordings? No, no, I, I don't, we can't do that. Yes, you can. You can turn it on. It's really important. Why? Because if your dashboard's loading within five seconds and it goes to server and it's 10 seconds, it's not your problem. It's either latency, it's the database, maybe it's the network, maybe the server is underpowered, any number of different things. But understanding that you can assess that and identify that's important. In the appendix of this, and they will distribute this, I've got a whole bunch of checklists that you should do, what site admins should look at on a weekly basis, what you should look at in terms of content and data management, all those sorts of things. But I thought that'd just be kind of boring to throw a bunch of checklists up there. And you can also find them all online on, on Blueprint as well. So I'd recommend you go take a look at those, because you can stick those on your wall of your cube or your office or your home, wherever you work. And you can look at that and say, hey, these are the things that I should be doing. So let's talk about best practices for a minute. There's essentially four best practices that we're going to talk about. There's visual analytics, right? That's the science behind it. There's the analysis cycle. There's the visual best practices, and then there's the organizational assets. And within the visual best practices, I also lump um, performance. So we're going to go through each of these in this next section. So 160,000 years ago, when you're out on the Serengeti, and you're running around, and you're having a good time, a lion comes up. You can identify that lion quickly because of the ways your eyes are built. 
size, shape, color, right? How far is that thing from me? How big is that thing? What color is that thing, right? Is it gray? Is it an elephant? Or is it a lion, right? We can take advantage of these things through visual analytics because the visual cortex is very fast. The cerebral cortex is very slow. So if you stop to think, is that a lion? You're done, Wrong. right? But if you take advantage of your visual cortex, it's like that, instantaneous. All of our ancestors did that, otherwise we wouldn't be here today. And so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the science of visualization. We're taking advantage of the way our brains simply work. And if you don't believe me, this guy wrote a book about it and won a Nobel Prize in economics for it. So don't take my word, there's a lot of research out there around this. Why is that? Size, color, shape, we can use pre-attentive attributes, and I say pre because they're processed quickly by the visual cortex, they're not going through our brain. And so that's how we can help that executive understand within an instant what the story is we're trying to tell them. Oh, that's an outlier. Yes, it is. Rather than peeling through pages of numbers. Many of you might have seen this. How many nines are on the page? 11, right? You guys have seen it before. You're not supposed to yell it out. Come on, you're supposed to be impressed. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> Makes it easy. Text is not a pre-attentive attribute. When you were in the Serengeti, you were not running from a letter A. Okay? People speak all kinds of different languages, right? Our eyes are not wired to process that way. Color makes it pop. Now, unfortunately, if I were losing money, hemorrhaging, it would all be red, and that wouldn't work, right? So we have to be thoughtful about it. But the better way to do this is to turn it into a visual presentation. Now you can see several different overlays. We have the size of the bars. We have the colors of the bars. I can identify a lot of questions that I want to ask now. So that's what, that's what we're trying to do. That's the science of visual analytics. I could talk about this for another 45 minutes, but I'm going to stop here. It's one of my favorite presentations because it's so interesting. Now, the visual analysis cycle, right? This is what I was talking about earlier. It starts out with a task. It starts out with a question. Free your mind. Ask questions. It's so important. Now, there's something important here. There's two types of activities. There's an exploratory activity and there's a declarative exercise. It's important to know when you start your task what type of activity path you're engaging on. A declarative exercise is when your boss says, I need revenue year over year for the last five years for my presentation. That should take you about 45 minutes at most. It should be crisp and clear and done. That's it. Here you go. We're not going to talk about this. That is what it is. <clears throat> An exploratory exercise is much different. That lends itself much more to this visual analysis cycle, right? That's where you're gonna go say, maybe I need some other people in this. Maybe we need to whiteboard it out. Maybe I need a data scientist. Where's the data coming from? So first go get your data. And when you get your data, think about repeatable processes. How do I look at this data? How are you gonna do this in the future? Let's really understand where it's coming from. Then you're going to choose your visual mapping. That means picking an appropriate chart is all it is, and not a frickin' pie chart, OK? <laughs> a bar chart. If you're doing revenue, it's going to be a bar chart. If you're doing time, right, you usually use lines. If it's geographic, you can use a map sometimes, not only. Sometimes a bar is better. But there are a lot of different charts out there. Pick the right one. And if your organization has prescribed charts for certain things, for God's sake, use them, because you won't confuse people then. Right, so you pick your visual mapping, and then you look at the data. Where are my outliers? Where are my questions? How do I need to think about this differently? Well, go talk to a friend. Hey, look at this, what do you think about this? Share it with somebody. We've got something good. Then go tell your boss. Hey, take a look at this. 
I think sales are down, and I think it's because Bob's been sleeping through his lunch. I don't know what it is. It doesn't matter. Whatever the insight is, share it with somebody, and then decide how you're going to act on it. And it might be the act is starting all over again because you've uncovered more questions. And you might go through this two or three times. You might bring in more people. Eventually, you're going to get to the point where you can actually do something with it. This is the cycle of visual analytics. Know it. Put it on your cube wall. You have to educate people, though. Right? If your boss tells you that you ask you a question and you go, oh, this is an exploratory exercise, well, then you might want to just confirm with him that he understands that you're going to want to iterate. You're going to want to talk through these things together. You're going to want to think about it. You might have a couple meetings and just validate that your perception around what he wants is correct. I'll keep you from getting into trouble. Roundabouts. Who lives in a state here with roundabouts? I used to live in Ohio. I had a bunch of them. I used to live in Washington, D.C. They put stoplights in the middle of them. I don't understand that. It doesn't. It just defeats the whole point of a roundabout. And actively in Europe, there are lots of them, particularly Spain and Portugal. I'll be in the car with my wife. I always forget to plan out the roundabouts. And you see, I have glasses, so it's hard for me. And we get into one, and we're going like this. And after a while, she's trying to look at the map. She's not so great with maps. I'm driving. I can't read them. And eventually, I just pick a direction, right? It's not ideal. Does it work? It's, you know, the conversation is not positive at that point in time. This is not what you want to happen with your dashboards, OK? This is what you're trying to avoid. Dashboards should be about clarity, period, full stop. There are some tricks you can use to ensure that you're not getting caught in a roundabout or that your executive is not getting caught in a roundabout. Because you know what happens when you make executives feel stupid? They get mad. And they might not know it, but they're looking at your dashboard and they're thinking in their head, I'm a smart guy or gal, and I can't seem to figure this out. So you just made them feel stupid, and they don't like that. So here's some rules. Most important thing goes in the upper top left corner. Provide interactivity with user discovery. Be judicious. Filters are a great power, young Padawans. But don't put too many of them on the page, right? Because it can get confusing very quickly. You know the data, OK? If you have a whole bunch of filters there and all your views are changing, you're, you're like, this is masterful, right? Somebody else is going to look at that, and they're going to go through the filters, and they're going to forget where they started because they don't know the data that well, right? You create this thing called a visual interruption. And that's part of my science presentation. You have a, you know, an idyllic or a farm in a bucolic setting, and then I put up a gray blob, and I talk for a minute, and then I show you a, f a picture of the same thing with something taken out of it. It's very hard to identify it. So you create these visual interruptions. It's just the way that our brains work. It goes back to how we evolved. So you don't want to do that. No scrolling. Scrolling create visual interruptions. It's hard to remember what was above. I'm trying to hold things in my mind. Do you know why it's the seven most successful habits of highly intelligent leaders, whatever, whatever, whatever? Because nobody can hold more than a phone number in their head. You have to remember that. Minimal color. Make it rich. Be consistent. If revenue is red, on one chart, don't make it green. On another chart, use the consistent colors within your organization so that people aren't trying to figure out what you're trying to tell them so they don't get confused. For God's sake, put proper headers and instructions there. I want to show you something. This is a great layover that somebody did. I found this on Tableau Public. And you just clicked on. Come on, open up. There we go. <clears throat> you just clicked on a button, and this overlay appeared over the top of the viz. And then when you clicked it, it went away. Look how creative that is for getting rid of all the clutter and just showing somebody exactly what they need to click on. Right? 
and then use common, cha uh, common chart types. X-axis for time, scatter plot. There is a great guide out there called the Financial Times uh, Visual Vocabulary. And they give you all of the types of charts that you should be using based on the information you have. Now, Tableau does this really well already. It looks at, oh, you have two data points. We're going to put it in a scatter plot through Show Me. But there's an infinite number of charts out there. So try to use them how people are used to seeing them. It'll help you out. It'll help your user out. So let's go back to our. Yeah, sure. Andy Kriebel does a great version of this on Tableau Public, where you can actually uh, see the different charts in uh, Tableau. I don't think he lets you download it, unfortunately, but um, he, does a, he did a great job of recreating this um, in Tableau with, um, I think, some other people as well. Hmm? Oh, you can? Oh, great. I thought he, he took that away recently, but. Or maybe it was just me. I just wasn't paying attention. It happens sometimes. Don't tell anybody. All right, so now we have to speed forward. Five fuser viewer in a dashboard. This goes back to the rotary. Get too many views in there, and you start spinning around, you know what's going on. I like to challenge people to try to do it in four. Viz and viz dual tips allows you to slip another one in there. Those can be really powerful. Legends go near their views. I can't tell you how many times I find legends all clustered over to the right or the bottom. And I'm like, I don't know. I have to stop. And I have to think about it. And that tires me out. People don't, you don't want people thinking about vizs. You want them using their visual cortex. I know I keep coming back to this, because if nothing, if you walk away with nothing else, use the visual cortex. And then lastly, use tooltips, viz and viz tooltips. Very powerful. Now, designing for performance. We have a guide out there. It's like, God, 50, 60, 70 pages that was written by Alan. It's a wonderful guide for designing dashboards for, for performance. Last year, Lovekesh did a wonderful talk on designing for performance. I'm sure he did the same one this year. I just didn't know what time it was. But this is the one from last year. I would recommend that you watch it, because it's awesome. And it's really simple and easy to do. It's this easy to do. I'll show you. Watch. Let's go find a workbook. Let me see, where did I put this? Let's go to Tableau. What I can do is do new. Actually, I'm just going to go to help, settings and performance. I'm going to start a performance recording. Then I'm going to open a workbook, right? And then I can go to a bad design, see how long it takes to load. And then I can click around in here. You're just trying to replicate what you would actually do if you were using it. And then I go to help. I go stop performance recording. And then Tableau will create a viz around that workbook. And it'll show you the times that it took to compute each of these actions. So here you can see computing the layout took 1.3 seconds. Connecting to the database took 1.32 seconds. Computing the layout 
right? So now you can see like what's taking so long. Now this is a relatively simple one, but if you have calculations in there, it's gonna show that. If you're rendering 30,000 points, it's gonna show that. What you really wanna understand is, are you connecting to too much data? Are your calculations, calculations are slowing it down? Do you need to aggregate? Maybe your KPIs need to be from a different aggregated data source. Maybe your middle charts can, from, can come from a slightly less aggregated. And if you really need some detail at the bottom, but then you bang against the live connection, right? So there's tricks that you can use to optimize your dashboards. And a performance recording is a really easy way to do that. I mean, you saw, I just did it in a couple seconds. And then you can whittle it down. You start at the top, and you just go down until you get to the point where it's performing in a way that you think is reasonable. And then you can go back to your server admin. You can say, I want you to test this on the server. This one was banging against the entire data set. That's why it was a bad design. I tell everybody about that because it's just so easy to do. This is what I call being a good neighbor. Lastly, there's organizational assets. These are templates, these are colors, these are charts the way that your organization thinks. They should be located somewhere, it should be easy to access. There's a lot of stuff online on, on the different files and locations and where to do that. I'm not gonna walk you through that, you can literally just Google it. There's a lot of stuff out there. But this creates a consistent feel across your organization. It makes it really easy for senior people to consume a lot of content because it all looks the same, it all feels the same, it all has the same colors, we're all using the standard charts, things are placed in the right places. Think about equity research from one of your banks. They all look pretty much the same every time you get it from that bank, right? There's a reason for that. They have their logo here, they have their color bar here, have some points, then they have the research. It's because they want you to become comfortable with that so that when you pick it up, you know exactly what you're looking at. That's what you want to achieve with your organizational assets. You want a brand look and feel for your organization. And it's easier if you start early, right? Like if you're working with just a small team of people, your team, close proximity, go rip on the server, it doesn't matter. But at the point you start thinking about distributing it beyond your immediate working group, you should start putting it in a template because now it's gonna be, be presented to people. That's a representation of your work. Go ahead. It's not about stifling innovation. There might be a better way to visualize it. Right? But if everybody's look, been looking at revenue year over year like this, right, we don't need to recreate the wheel on that one. But there are things that we do need to recreate the wheel on. I agree. And there are new ways to look at data that show those outliers. I wholeheartedly agree. But we, we might want to use the color patterns that our organization prescribes, right? Because then it's easier for people to consume. You can play around with this to make it fit for your organization. A lot of organizations like, forget about it, we're just not gonna do this. What is important though, is whatever layer level you decide to do, create a way to share these best practices. Create a way to share these best practices. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. You all have subject matter experts within your organization. Maybe your SMEs, I always have a hard time with that should be onboarding people. Maybe you can use your community. Maybe when you have a user group or a doctor session, at the beginning you can just remind everybody, hey everybody, this is where I keep our best practices, these are where I keep our colors, we should all be trying to use these. You know, it doesn't have to be a, uh, a big thing, a big project. You can do it surreptitiously. And then lastly, you can run a Viz design workshop. This is actually online. Everything that looks like a hyperlink is actually a hyperlink. 
it's really kind of fun. And this is an opportunity to communicate those best practices within an, an engagement, a community engagement. Remember, that was on the community track at the bottom in the middle, right? So now we have a fun activity. We're bringing everybody in, and we're promoting best practices. So we're killing two, boards with, two uh, birds with one proverbial stone. And a lot of these activities do go across a, different, a, a ton of different subway stops there. So you can blend these together and accomplish more. So, what do we talk about? We talked about education, which is identifying the right education program for your organization. I recommend that it's based off of roles, job roles. When I talk to people, almost unanimously, everybody believes that they get more from education designed around job roles than they do just broad-based education. But you might not be ready for that. You might want to do license education. There's a lot of free resources out there. Curate them, and then communicate those out to people. Then we talked about measurement, user behavior, deeper than just vanity metrics. I've got 100,000 users on my server. That's great. What are you doing about it? Nothing. Not great. Understand what your users are doing. Come up with best practices to enforce in your organization. If you're not using your license, tell them you're going to take it away. If their dashboard, no one's looking at it, take it down. If the extract is slow, find out why. Right? It's a very powerful way. And distribute that work out. It doesn't, if you're a server admin, you don't have to own it all. You can push content out to your site admin. And your site admin can push out to the project admins to make sure that dashboards are performing optimally. Right? We can do this as a community activity. Nobody needs to own this by themselves. And by the way, if you're the server admin, you can use row-level security, pull that Postgres out, bang it into a dashboard, push it out to your site admins and your project leaders, and you're not going to see anybody else's stuff. Well, no, nah, novel concept, right? Let's distribute the work across the community. It makes it easier for all of us. And then lastly, and we just talked about it, analytics best practices. Visual, right? The Serengeti. <laughs> I love doing that one. Um, performant, right? Organizational assets. These are really easy things. You don't have to do them all at once. Maybe you just pick a few of these that you want to do and start with. Start small. If you have a COE, volunteer. Ask them if you can help out with some of these things. Maybe you want to run a Viz workshop. So I put some related sessions up here for you. J.P. Morgan Chase happened yesterday, but they recorded it. And I put it up here anyway because it was such a great session. We had 250 people in the room. And it was about how they implemented their Skill Belt program. They've had over 1,500 people go through it in under a year. And they have like 25 Jedi Masters or something like that now. And so I thought you'd be really interested in that. Designing a corporate standard for your dashboards, that is Friday. And since we just talked about organizational assets, I thought that might be appropriate. And lastly, this session does repeat tomorrow. So if your friends want to come and you go, hey, this is a pretty good session, tell them about it, send them on over. We'll do it one more time. And then lastly, please, please uh, complete the survey about this session. Let us know if you liked it. Let us know if you didn't like it, because we can always make improvements on it. And now if anybody has any questions, we can do some questions. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Woohoo!